<laughs> I'm with Eric White. Eric, thank you so much for coming back on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Zach. It's a pleasure, man. I felt like it was such a cheat to have you only on a podcast because the conversation went really well. People before they're hearing this or seeing this will be able to hear our initial conversation, which I edited down a little bit to keep the salient parts and talk about who you are. But this, in earnest, is, I'd like to call this the official episode with Eric. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm on board, man. I enjoyed the first conversation and yeah, I appreciate you wanting to do this again to have the video. For sure. Um, you're the host of the EW podcast, which I've mm -hmm. been on, had the pleasure to be on. Um, and you and I met, of course, as part of the unity movement. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start there. What is the EW podcast and how did it come to be? How'd you get into podcasting or putting your ideas out there? Yeah. So I guess you could trace, um, that back to even college, I was a journalism major. So I've always had an interest mm. in storytelling and um, being, you know, creative, creative outputs. Um, I never used my journalism major after college, really. I ran a little blog, but I never really was interviewing people or anything like that. I, I, my, my work has taken me in other directions. But um, yeah, I went through an experience of being depressed for about almost 10 years. Um, and there were really bad moments in there of um, attempting to take my own life even. Um, and coming out of that, which I eventually did through the uh, several events, several things, um, you know, a loving community, which is something we've talked about, um, a psilocybin trip and uh, a lot of therapy kind of all came together to help me get out of that funk. And as I got out of it, I was like, oh man, I wonder how many other people are going through something similar and don't know how to get out of it. I, and I also was genuinely curious about the mind and how it was possible for me to be in a state where, you know, I've said before that the, it, it, it was like my world was desaturated, like it was black and white and coming out of it, you know, colors were more vibrant, life seemed more vibrant and vivid. And it was a total shift in just my perspective of the world. And that so there was some genuine curiosity on my part of wanting to learn more about the mind and talk to people who know more about this stuff um and also at the time i was really interested in podcasting i just you know i think in the last 10 years as well that's become kind of a medium that uh is really accessible for listeners just because you can, you know, obviously do it while you're working, while you're doing the dishes, whatever, and being able to have those free flowing conversations, it's, uh, it can be really fun. So I, I figured why not put these things together and start my own podcast and, you know, push myself in that way. So when you were a journalism major, did you do that because you had a general interest uh, in seeking information, delivering information? Yeah. So I mean, my interest at the time was sports. So I, my dream was to be a sports broadcast journalist. Um, mm. And halfway through college, I kind of, I got diverted from that um, typical journalism um, sequence and got involved in advertising, which in the school was in this school of journalism. So I was still taking journalism classes. My focus was more on advertising and um you know, project management, coming up with creative and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the the interest has always been just about stories and wanting, I, I don't know, there's a little bit too there of wanting to be seen, which I think comes, is something that uh, I don't know if you can relate to or not, but, you know, I think especially when I was depressed, which I was in college, there was a, a belief that being known or being seen would be, a way for me to feel better. Like I, I felt as though there was um, uh, a respect or love from other people that I wasn't getting that I needed to get through being on TV or, or being heard. So there was a little bit of that, but also a genuine interest in stories. You, may, uh, you mentioned this last time we talked about wanting to be seen and I, I've been thinking on it now. And you asked me if I could relate, don't remember what I said, but um, if I said no, I'm wrong because to some extent, I never want to be seen. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, I want to be acknowledged and seen at my best and like never seen at my worst. That's a, mm -hmm. a fault of, you know, a flaw of mine. And um, I'm coming to grips with that. Like, just the more I try to be authentic, 
the more I could be okay with people seeing me fuck up or, you know, whatever, say the wrong thing or, or not say something elaborately enough. And so I'm coming to grips with that. And I'm curious if that, if that's something similar for you. Yeah. I, so it, it's actually, it's actually interesting. And maybe you can relate to this with your own experience um, dealing with heroin and now, you know, talking about topics related to that in terms of addiction. And um, I think when I was depressed, there was a desire to only be seen at my best. But I think mm -hmm. as I've come out of that, one, my desire to be famous has not evaporated, but it's become way smaller. Like I don't, I don't feel the same way about being known as I did then. And I also respect the value of my worst more now than I did then when I right. was my worst. Like I think now I look at those worst moments as being the things that make me relatable to other people. And I, I view it as something that is good and should be talked about. So. Nice. So when, uh, let's see, it seems like the story in my mind, and so for, please feel free to push back. Don't let me write it for you. Is that you kind of had a, you were on a trend of being a journalistic kind of a person and getting things out there, maybe being seen more often, but that was stymied by an overall depression or lack of connection or lack of, lack of connection with people and meaning in life. Mm -hmm. What, if that's to the extent that's true, and correct me if I'm wrong, how old were you around that time that you felt like going on a downward trend? Um, so it really became noticeable to me. I mean, it really started in 26, 2006 hmm. um, was kind of the emergence of this depression. Um, but I think it really peaked for me in my junior year of college. So 2006, I would have been a, a sophomore in high school. Um, and it was my junior year of college. Um, some, you know, what is that? Five years later, um, where it started to peak for me. And I think from that point on about 2011 to 2014 was kind of the worst worst for me. And it, that was a period um, where my depression had gotten so bad and I had become kind of so accustomed to the worst parts of it that I in fact viewed it as the thing that made me unique. And so I, I was simultaneously dealing with these self-destructive patterns of thought and behaviors that were holding me back from doing the things I wanted to do, but I was simultaneously romanticizing them and believed that, you know, binge drinking alone and being mad when I woke up, I believed that these things were the things that made me unique and would eventually help me be known. So it was a really, it's a weird thing to think about. So you're a uh, junior in college. Did you finish college? Yeah. Yep. And at, at the standard track? Yeah, yep, yeah, four years. Yep, coasted but, through the last year, but made it. <laughs> understood. And to ask me how I know, man. Um, but and so into young adulthood, you were feeling sort of isolated. I guess would be the word. Sort of romanticizing the the destructiveness of it, but but feeling isolated all the while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I I did it to myself in a way. I. I moved out to San Diego after graduating college in Ohio. And I moved, I bought a one-way ticket actually the summer before my senior year. So I went through my whole senior year knowing I would be leaving the East Coast and coming West. I didn't bother looking for a job or trying to find a place to live or making friends. So I came out to San Diego with nothing. I was, I was uh, literally alone um, in that sense. And I was so depressed. I didn't have any motivation to find new people. So it was an extremely solitary period of my life for sure. Yeah. And so how did you build yourself? Well, we'll get to, we'll get to the good stuff, like, <laughs> um, you know, sort of triumphantness and psychedelics and um, everything that you do now. But I mean, how did you put yourself together with, you didn't, I guess you didn't have a job and you didn't know people and you didn't, you're just kind of there. Yeah. Yeah. I was Take just through that. Yeah. So I, I remember I, I landed in San Diego and I had booked a hotel for, I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but for in El Cajon, which is east of the major part of San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I, I was so naive, dude. I, I like had uh, a bunch of resumes printed out and I was like, I'm going to walk to all these places 
hand deliver my resume, show what I'm made of in person. And I, I remember the first day I was here, I ended up walking like 15 miles or something just around town. Didn't end up giving my resume anywhere, just ended up walking all around town trying to find these newspapers and places where I thought I was going to just storm in and win everyone's hearts and minds. And that didn't, that didn't pan out. Um, so I eventually had to um, go for a job at Best Buy, which I, I'm lucky I got. And I also found another job doing some um, travel editing for a Las Vegas website. So I was, had these two jobs, found an apartment on Craigslist um, and thought things would get better. <laughs> so you got some gigs. So wait, hold on. Uh, <laughs> you started, you walked for 15 miles. Why didn't you get to the, to the places that you were going to drop your application off? So I got to one and I, I thought that, that I would be, I had maybe 10 or 15 copies of my resume, you know, in a folder, really nice, printed out, ready to go. I made it to one. I think I made it to the San Diego Tribune. But I was just so disorganized in my thinking. I didn't really have a good plan of attack. I just kind of had this dream of being of like pushing the doors open and everyone being like, oh, wow, who is that guy? Meanwhile, I'm like dripping sweat. You know, if I had walked in someplace, I mean, I did walk into the San Diego Tribune and, I'm, and I was just dripping sweat profusely. They were probably like, oh, my God, this guy is a nut. <laughs> so, yeah. This might be off target, but do you feel like you would be doing stuff that you're doing now if you didn't have that experience of trying those things? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. It, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I would like to think that I would have eventually gotten here, but then it's, you know, how do you, how do you, I, I, it's impossible for me to even conceptualize. Yep getting to this point without experiencing everything that I that have you've experienced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess the, tr the way I was taking it is that, you know, it's all nice and fanciful and cute to say stuff like, uh, you know, failures lead to success or whatever. But I have noticed that when I've been, when I've dreamed big and then I go to actually do the practical thing that I was dreaming about. And I realized that there were, you know, 10, 20 infinite more steps to it and hurdles than I thought. I've formed a better relationship with reality because of that. Mm, mm, so uh, yeah. that's, that's where my mind immediately went. It's like you had big dreams of doing stuff in journalism and, and uh, working for all these places, but you realized that you, you were leaving something out in the vision, I guess you're leaving little. Yeah, no, thoughts. that's a great, that's a really good way of looking at it. It kind of, it's, you know, a harsh encounter with reality can make you reassess your, uh, your, thoughts on reality for sure and i think yeah. that's a great great way of putting it yeah so uh how did you get from where you were just kind of getting by your living but uh you mentioned having sort of a an eventual uptick in happiness and mm -hmm. just productivity overall yeah how did i get there yeah what's the transition look like without yeah like you said, we don't have we don't have to think about every event that led you there. No, no, no. It's uh, I mean, there's clearly a series of events that happened. Um, I so in college, I had started. Um, my my friends in college were very much into video production. They started a video production company while we were uh, juniors, I believe, and um, they were my drinking buddies, my, my best friends, friends I still talk to today um, and, and very close with. Uh, but I, I had no video experience at the time. And uh, I spent a lot of time watching one friend in particular. Um, he goes by Ted Cadillac, shout out to him. Um, I spent a lot of time over at his place watching him edit. We would just grab 40s and sit and edit videos. And I would just be sitting there watching. Um, Insert a picture of Ted with a 40 right there. And his, <laughs> yeah. Instagram handle. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I would sit there just watching him do this and becoming very interested in how he could take a bunch of uh, otherwise ambiguous footage and turn it into something, a narrative mm -hmm. um, and, and set to music. That was something I was really interested in. Um, and so when I was alone in San Diego, one good thing that happened to me was my cousin, um, his name is, he goes by Grinchero. He's a musician. He, or I guess at that time he went by Grinchero. Now he's Hazel Atlas. He moved out here to San Diego to be with me and he was playing music. And I started shooting videos of him doing music things. And 
developed my skills for shooting and editing. And um, fast forward probably two years or so, and I'm in LA now, and I'm working with a rapper named Chubby Jag on creating video content for him. He was a battle rapper turned uh, a hip hop artist, I guess, who is really good. And uh, was we, we worked together on these weekly videos called Flat Top Fridays. So I was you know, honing my skills more and more there. And that led me to um, eventually working with this group of DJs um, known as Desert Hearts. And they have a music festival and record label, um, which has blown up quite big. And they were uh, gracious enough to give me the opportunity to film their parties um, from early on meeting them. So basically my video skills allowed me to come to this community called Desert Hearts, which was eventually the main catalyst for me figuring out that how I was feeling was, was not normal. I met my current girlfriend through that group. Um, and I think I mean, we might've talked about this in the audio version of being um, in close proximity with people who were very happy and mm. who loved, loved each other very unconditionally. Yeah. Um, and so seeing that and being close with that on a very regular basis, um, yeah, I, I had some sort of osmosis go on where I was like, I need to figure my shit out. So that was the main, the main catalyst. So did, I mean, did you know before that, that you were depressed or do you feel like you were being de like delusional, uh, or like you only know you're depressed by in retrospect? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew I was depressed once I started to realize that these things were not normal, but going through it alone in San Diego, like I said, I had romanticized it to the point where I thought it was a good thing. And I, I had no, um, comparison point for my experience to another people. I wasn't open about what I was experiencing with anybody. I, I never talked to anybody about it. You know, I've talked to my college and high school friends since, um, all my my peak recovery I guess you would say and they had no, none of them had any idea that anything was wrong you know it was very easy for me to be the happy-go-lucky one around them while carrying this burden in my personal time hmm. and so there was n never anyone that was saying yo Eric that's that's not normal you know what you're experiencing it's not normal to wake up and feel like that it's not normal to to be so angry at yourself so um, yeah, it was totally a thing in that I didn't realize I was going through until I was almost out of it. Yeah. So I guess you, what you realized was how much potential there was to just be feeling better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it, yeah. That, that's a, a great way to put it. I realized that, um, I fully realized that the romanticized version of myself was not the best version of myself that, that I had, um, decided to allow actions to uh, manifest within my day-to-day -day that were actually holding me back from, you know, experiencing close relationships, from experiencing joys in life. Like it, it was really a, a crazy moment to look back on for sure. Let's talk about that psychedelic experience. We, you, you did touch on it when we talked in the audio podcast, but yeah, so this will stand alone. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think it was 2014 or 15. Um, it was at the, the Desert Hearts Met Festival, which I mentioned just now, um, which is a, a pretty crazy festival. It's three straight. They start on Friday and it goes till Monday and the music never stops. It's just one stage. Um, there's like three to four thousand people there. And I was in charge of the video crew um doing the, the festival recap and I think it was on a Sunday I would usually take a day off to just enjoy the festival and try to not stress about the video because at a festival where the music never stops it's hard to stop your anxiety or oh, your, sure, your, your feeling of you have to be in control so I took a day off I ate some some mushrooms and I was just standing on stage listening to the music and as I the mushrooms kind of took hold. I started to revisit all of the things I had been talking about in therapy, revisit conversations that I'd had with my mom. Um, and in a, literally, literally an instant, it was, I became overwhelmed with a sense of empathy for my mom, who um, maybe we can get into to help this stand alone. But I, you know, she had 
we had some events occur um, around 2006, kind of the inflection point for me, um, where our relationship completely changed and um, her love for me was in a way withheld as a result of some, some things that we were dealing with. And so in that, that psilocybin trip, I fully became em empathetic to the things that she was going through. And it gave me this release of being able to forgive her for anything that had happened, which was a really transformative process for me and something that um, I don't think would have been possible had I not been doing the other work around that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, going to therapy twice a month definitely played a huge part in me being able to access this sort of uh, perspective on the mushrooms. So that was, yeah. Would your mom agree? I think we actually broached this. Would your mom agree that there was love being withheld from her to you? Um, I think I, I don't, I don't know if we actually talked about this. I, I don't. So we did talk about how we disagree about what happened, mm -hmm. but I don't, I think, and I think that she would agree that in ways her love was withheld from me. Actually, I know she would. Yeah. She would agree with that because, um, yeah, I know she would. There was things that she did that she has apologized for that were not okay to do to a developing human, I don't think. And she's also apologized because she, which is, I, I don't know, maybe an arbitrary thing, but she decided to go to get her doctorate at the same time that I was in college. So she was never really there for me in a meaningful, meaningful way during college. She was always wrapped up in her own things. And mm. um, so I think, I actually, I, yes, to answer your question, I do think she would agree with that. Was yeah. it that, um, and sorry, I don't mean for this to be like psychoanal, you know. No, I'm down, man. I like, I like this. Yeah. Was Turn it the that, tables on you. <laughs> <laughs> was it that, um, that she couldn't put the energy into sufficiently being there for you? Or was it that she actively did things that were non-loving to you? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Um, yeah. I don't think I've actually talked about this part before with any, with really anyone besides my closest friends, but I, I would occasionally, you know, I, I started to get into alcohol and tobacco um, later in high school. I had been sober, completely sober my whole high school experience until uh, my junior year. And during this time, she took it really hard that I was experimenting with these things for some reason she wasn't able to accept this you know pretty natural um development their uh, i guess stage of of a person growing up and so i would come home after nights out to find you know very dramatic notes written on my bed from her and um, mm. her, her being closed off to me trying to address her about these notes and so it yeah, I mean, th those were some of the active things that were done. And then there was just a more passive kind of um, feigned, not feigned interest, but interest in my life for the wrong reasons, perhaps more from a control perspective than from like, a, I want to help my son, you know, navigate this world. So a couple of things interesting from that. Um, one, I've been, I was hesitant, you could even see it in my book to, uh, even though I've thought about it a lot, I have been hesitant in the past to accept the value of psychedelic therapies over time, or just the value mm -hmm. of psychedelics to change a perspective in a meaningful way, because mm -hmm. I'm so used to, um, what is, uh, what does Carl Hart call it? Drug exceptionalism. I'm so, I'm mm -hmm. so used to mm -hmm. people being like, you know, my drug is better than your drug kind of a thing. And so to champion their drug, they start explaining they can do more than it can. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, my relationship with a guy near me, Rick Barnett, who's went to school to become, uh, he's a, once federal regulations relax, then he'll be able to prescribe psychedelics. And I've talked to him and I've learned a lot through him. And one of the things that they do obviously is that on one hand, like if you go through any sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, it's sort of saying, all right, let's stop and, and think and reroute this those cognitive roadblocks that you have, those times you're being irrational or over-emotional so that you can't actually think through a problem mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. So like you were saying, you kind of had this experience where finally all those things you were thinking about and talking about the therapy, you're able to let in, you know, mm -hmm. like that those could be. And then yeah. the other thing I always find interesting about it is that, and I've had this, 
on MDMA, I remember reading Sam Harris's book and he expressed sort of the same thing mm-hmm. where I finally realized this, uh, there's some sort of emotional state or em- empathy state that's possible, but I actually haven't felt before. Mm-hmm. So it's like a hack or an unlock. And I know that I got it through drugs, but also th- it's just possible in general. It's not only drugs that can unlock a, a yeah. feeling empathy. So I'm extremely sympathetic now to when people tell me that they've had, and I'm noticing more and more that people are telling me that they've had these experiences and I'm able to parse people saying, um, you know, just psychonauts, they were going to say it no matter what versus yeah. <laughs> someone like you who's explaining in a way that I can understand what had happened. So it sounds like you were able to kind of uh, sidestep mental blocks that you've had in your life, emotional and mental blocks or irrational Mm. overly rational uh, frames of mind and then also have a great deal of empathy for your mother mm-hmm. maybe more people than that that you hadn't yeah. really had before and so that mm-hmm. that maybe freed you up to do a lot of useful things yeah yeah and i think that i the drug exceptionalism thing that dr carl hart talks about um i totally understand that because i, I being involved in the festival community somewhat um you know there's a lot of people who swear by drugs by their drug Mm -hmm. think that think that everyone should do drugs they say you know the world would be a better place if people just took some acid or something and you know maybe it would maybe it wouldn't you know and because i always just view it as like it if you have a great experience on a drug and after that drugs ex- drug wears off, you're not able to incorporate it into your life. Right. right and exactly. what the fuck does it matter? You're just high. You're just high feeling really good. And it yeah. doesn't matter. It's not making the world a better place. So I don't know. That's, that's, I, I think that there just needs to be a middle ground of, between like no drugs and do everyone do this drug. You know, it's like, the, eh, maybe not. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But yeah. anyway, it's, it's possible. And it definitely seemed to be at least a stepping stone and, you make it to progress. It sounds like a developmental time too, when that stuff sort of happens. So maybe mm-hmm. you had like a nice crossroads of experiences happening for you. You know, you're, yeah. you're around people who are doing something meaningful and that was interesting. You've been working on yourself in a lot of different ways. You had this experience where it was mind altering. So anyway, um, getting into your podcast, it's going to be, it be a nice segue to say again, that still to this date, I've listened to several episodes now and my favorite podcast episode of the ew podcast is the one with your mother yeah and i i wasn't sure i didn't realize at the time exactly what it was that you guys have between you you sort of discussed a little bit in the in -hmm. the podcast but there was some raw emotion in that episode that was like raw empathy like i could tell you were having this conversation with your mother uh being so empathetic but you could just i don't know how to say this that just there are words, there are concepts, and then there's tonality and emotion mm, that just can mm-hmm. shine through. And that episode that you did with your mother, there's something about it that's just like, there's something so meaningful in there. No matter what you, I feel like no matter what you talked about, it was going to be meaningful. <laughs> so, Thanks, man. I appreciate I, that. Of course. Of course. I guess I should have let you respond to that. As as <laughs> no, no. Up. It's all good. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but that's not to say that other episodes of yours haven't been tremendous. So what I would like, to talk about how you got into podcasting and how that has served a role in your life now. Yeah. Um, So starting off the podcast was a way for me to continue learning and also feel as though I was doing something to help. You know, I didn't have many listeners. It's not a very big podcast, but it, it, it gave me a sense of purpose, which I think you know, obviously everyone needs that, that sense. Um, and now, I mean, my, my perspective on it has evolved quite significantly since I started it, you know, it started as it, it started from a place of fear sort of it, it combined with that curiosity, the fear of like, Oh my God, we're all just walking around with traumas in our past that we've not dealt with. And I've come to realize that, you know, that's true for some people. Some people undoubtedly have traumas that they're not dealing with. But I, I think that the trauma thing maybe gets overstated a little bit these days where people are like, oh, if you're upset, it's because you're traumatized. It's like, well, no, maybe they just 
need to find something in life that, that makes them feel like they have a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've evolved in that sense, but I've also evolved in that the podcast is no longer just about mental health topics. It's, it's, I've since coming, switching my perspective on the world a little bit and just evolving with age, I now just have people on that I'm interested in people. I just want to talk to I've had a historian on, um, to talk about the fall of Rome. I've had uh, musicians on just to talk about creativity. So really now it's, it's not even so much now about, oh man, I need to help people out. Now it's just like, I'm, I just like doing it. I like talking to people. It makes me a sharper person. And if people listen and find something useful, that's great. So I don't know. I think, yeah, it started as a way for me to address a fear that I had and has now become something that I like doing and want to get better at, you know? Have you, um, when you started and you talked about, you know, you had a bent, like I had these traumatic instances, I felt shitty and then I sort of am finding a purpose. And so I better help other people who are having that kind of a thing. Yeah. Was, was that in earnest? I mean, did you totally, totally believe that? Or did you feel like me? Well, I should end the question there. No, no. What were you going to say? Or maybe because uh, I'm, I'm curious. Or maybe what... not. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I'll really back to myself again. I'm okay. not trying to talk about myself. I just, uh, it's the most fair thing to do. Uh, when I started a podcast, I thought you needed to help people too but that but it turns out looking back on it i had maybe didn't really know how to articulate it but i had different um aspirations also it wasn't just Mm -hmm. like you know when i looked at okay who's listening to the podcast now i wasn't thinking at first i wonder how many people i helped i wonder how many people deserved i wonder Mm -hmm. how it was Mm -hmm. like i wonder how many people heard my ideas and liked them yeah Um, that kind of a thing and i'm wondering if if you've had a progression like that, where you've become yeah. more and more honest and valued in your work. Yeah. I appreciate you giving me your experience. Cause I didn't know, I really didn't know how to articulate what you just said. I appreciate the, the multiple choice option. Sure. sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you could but, choose other. Yeah. No, but I think that's extremely accurate. Like I, I was more concerned about listenership than I was about are people using the ideas to improve their life? I think that's super accurate. And I never really thought about it like that, but um, yeah, that definitely played a part in it. And I think that now, so, okay, that played a part in it because in a way I felt as though I was entering a space that maybe I didn't belong in. So I wanted validation from a growing listenership to know that I was doing the right thing. Oh, really well said. Yep. Yeah. So I, 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 no experience in mental health besides my own, no, you know, study or anything. And so I'm interviewing like a therapist, I'm interviewing, you know, wh- whoever, and it, it, there's this imposter syndrome that goes with that. And also mm-hmm. a pressure that I was putting on myself to sound like I knew what I was talking about. And so, yeah, I, I was looking at the viewership as a sort of validation for me to to feel better about what I was doing, which I've definitely gotten over. Yeah, well, for the most part, gotten over. <laughs> well, because it sounds, even when you were just talking about how you started, you were you said it with the caveat right away. Like I wanted to talk about people's traumas issue for some people, but you know, and yeah. you're very much more clear and seemingly proud of the subsequent statements. Like I just kind of like talk engaging with the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's cool because you can, uh, you know, if you're anything like me, then it gives you a podcast gives you an excuse to talk in maybe an intellectual or interesting way, long form with people you just wouldn't have those conversations yep. with otherwise. Nailed it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I that's so in the beginning, I was definitely looking at it as um, I'm going to make a name for myself. I'm going to I'm going to help all these people. People are going to respect me because I'm doing this. And now since opening up the conversations and accepting, accepting my limitations in a way I've now just, it gets me geeked out to just talk to like someone I'm reading, someone whose book I read and they're open to talking to me. It's like, Whoa, cool. I would probably never be talking to this person otherwise. And Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, you nailed it on the head there. What are some of your favorite episodes to date? Um, Today? I really like ours. It's one of my favorites. One of my most listened to for sure. I love, love talking with you on that one too. Yeah, that was a great one. Um, 
some other good ones. I had a good one with my friends, Evan, Casey, and Marbs, where we talked about, it was right as the pandemic was starting, um, and we were talking about silver linings from the pandemic. Um, I had this woman on, Barbara Aerosmith Young, who had some serious learning difficulties growing up, and she was able to create a like she she wasn't able to read an analog clock. She couldn't interpret the symbols and why what the big hand and little hand meant. She just, you know, could not do it. And she was able to come up with a series of uh, training exercises where she fixed all of her learning, addressed all of her learning difficulties, and now has programs for schools. Has her own school where she's helping kids with learning difficulties. So Ooh, I missed was, this one. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a really good book too. It's called the Ch uh, the woman who changed her brain think the woman who okay. changed your brand and it, that one was one of my still one of my favorites and i yeah i'd recommend that one and i have a couple i'm not sure when this one will come out but um two that are coming out that i'm really excited about one with our mutual contact anthony magnavosco uh, which i'm stoked about looking forward to that yeah and um another with uh, the author and chess grandmaster jonathan rosen i don't know if you're familiar with him at all but mm -mm. Yeah, he wrote a he wrote a book called uh, a ch uh, the moves of life a chess or no the moves that matter a chess grandmaster on the game of life. Okay, was he on uh, what's his name the MIT guy, the robotics that has uh, Lex Friedman? Oh, podcast? Lex Friedman. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, he might he might have been. He's he's a really interesting guy. He's like in the game B world a little mm. bit, where he has an organization called Perspectiva that's um, a conglomeration of thinkers, artists, and they're all trying to solve game B type questions. Let's talk about what game B means for people who don't know. Yeah, so it's basically an alternate an alternative to the current way society is structured. So they look at it as we're in game A right now. And there are clearly things that aren't working about it. So how can we develop a society that will better serve uh, everyone? So that's that's kind of how I would interpret it. Do you have a different interpretation of it? No, no, that's 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 the trick. But it gets me thinking about something that we haven't talked about on this podcast yet, which is that we sort of met that way. I think we are our heads mm -hmm. are in that space with um, in the unity movement which it wasn't, well, you, I'll let you maybe explain a little bit about it, but it, I don't know that it's perfect. It was sort of done in rush order, but uh, it's Brett Weinstein's brainchild. Mm -hmm. And it was really like a, a last minute attempt to say, listen, I've been thinking about this way that we could have governance of our country and keep the constitution intact and keep our rights, you know, preserve our rights and preserve the things we all value, but it would go differently than it currently is. And it would help our divide. Mm -hmm. And I got super interested in this, and I, apparently you did too. Yeah, me by, too. By trying sure. to push out a, a, some content for them. Will you mm -hmm. talk about that and how you found it? And maybe you could do a little better description than what I did. Yeah, no, I think you did a good a good job describing it. I mean, it was, I, I don't know if you said the 2020 presidential election specifically, uh, but it, it, was a, it was an attempt to get a third option, that uh, a, a bipartisan third option on the ticket um, to steer us from, you know, uh, two bad choices, <laughs> basically. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I saw him talk about it first on the Joe Rogan experience sometime in that summer. And just the idea of someone actually doing something, you know, I was, it was driving me crazy that the fact that we had several good options in the Democratic primary, you know, Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang and Bernie, we're all people who actually care about people and are making some sense. You know, you can agree or disagree and call Bernie a communist or whatever, but yep. his heart is in the right place. He actually wants to solve things. And you, I would believe that he would be um, less willing to, or less likely to uh, govern ideologically and more willing to do what is necessary. So I, I don't know. It was just very invigorating to me to know that I could be involved potentially with something um, that would bring more, um, what's the right word, uh, reasonable governance to, the, to, our, to our country. And mm. so, yeah, I signed up for the volunteer network. Um, and that's where we met in the Unity Now podcast, which is still going on. I have um, since 
I, I, last week, actually, I, I, I've stepped away from my involvement, but still, still watching. So I have a cult detection kit that I use for myself, which, uh, <laughs> which I realized was, it runs parallel to startup detection kits, which I should have also. But I signed up for volunteering. I thought, all right, well, let's see. Um, actually, it was somewhat, I don't remember how it worked, but somehow I got in touch with somebody who said, oh, you should sign up here and then we could do something with your podcast. And uh, I signed up and right, right as I put my name on, it was like five minutes later, someone said, Hey, well, how would you like to help here? Here's things you could do. Great to have you aboard. I was like, Hey, wait a minute. Why was that, <laughs> you know, why was that so easy? Um, but it really was, it was just a grassroots movement of people who were trying to figure out some way to, as you say, there's a trillion, if we really cared about the best candidate running for president, it's like that someone else said this, it should be like, um, how does it say? It's like a slam dunk competition where there's so many smart, amazing people that it should be one candidate after another. And then next mm. one is, Oh my God. Whoa. Right. And you know, just Holy shit. You're so smart. You know, you have the greatest ideas. They should all be people. Andrew Yang shouldn't surprise us, you know, no. yeah, 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 big yeah, ideas good. like that sh shouldn't. So I've always been sympathetic to the idea of creating some new, um, new way of establishing the governance in the first place, mm -hmm. which I think is what was, happening in that space yeah that's an interesting way of looking at it that these types of people like andrew yang shouldn't be surprising and i think it it just speaks to the lack of ideas like there's no there's no I, biden wasn't running and i on any you know sexy or, or interesting ideas he was just we're gonna go back to normal things are gonna be normal and so it, i don't mm. know it's just it's to me it's just the ultimate bummer that we live in this place where so much is possible. There's so many smart people. We technology makes uh, opens up so many new doors, and we just have a you know what 75 year old dude saying things are just going to go older. back to how they're yeah, yeah things yeah. are going to go back to how they were four years ago. It's like right right thanks so, yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, so do you so. think do you think a lot about politics? No, <laughs> more more so since you started with that project. Um, so. Okay, this this is maybe interesting. Is that I was fairly a I was an apolitical Democrat for most of my life, where I I didn't really look into things, didn't care too much until Trump was elected, and then uh, my interests you know increased a little bit in what was going on. Um, and I think last year in particular, in per particularly after the George Floyd um, killing, I, I became way more critically um, critical of what was being said by either party and and um, well, way more but. skeptical. Um, and so I, I became hyper interested in politics up until the election. And then after the election, I like took this this month long break and I've kind of settled into this place of um, not apathy or, or agnosticism, but um, limited limited uh energy input you know i don't want to i don't want to be the guy that's like tied to the news or knows every story and i'm glad that there's people that exist like um the, the rising crew crystal ball and sagar and genti it's good that they're uh, absorbing every story but that's not that's not for me I, I i i don't know i think for most of us it's just about finding a healthy balance of mm. of knowing what's going on how does it affect you what do you believe in and not letting it dominate your life because i was getting i was having a hard time sleeping last year you know it, it, during the summer and, and the fall where it was like are we headed to doomsday like it feels like things are just gonna like are we gonna nuke each other are we about to nuke portland or something like what is going on and so i was running through all these doomsday scenarios all the time stuck to the news stuck to every story and I was picturing I, Trump, somebody saying, are we going to nuke Portland? And, and <laughs> like, Perk, can you do that? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 right now I'm just trying, I'm still working on it. You know, I, I go in and out of um, ignorance and too much. So I think it's just finding a healthy balance. Yeah. Well, good on you, man. And so I've, you seem like a creator more than a person who likes to stew on problems. Or yes. at least that's what you've been, that's what you thrived on. No, that, that I'm glad you said that. Cause that is, that's kind of my current internal battle right now that I'm having where 
there's so many intellectual people, you, you among them, like people who are really good at critically thinking and your podcast has been a great source of um, uh, example setting for me, I guess, of like how to use first principles, how to really uh, dissect a problem to its very core. What, you know, instead of just asking service level questions, really mm -hmm. getting in deep and really understanding things. And I don't know, I, I'm having this internal battle right now, which I think is healthy of like, you're not, are you striving to be this intellectual powerhouse or is there another way that you can, you know, contribute to the conversation? And so right now I'm trying to find this space of doing the creative thing, which I much prefer to thinking about a problem all day and trying to get to the bottom of it. I'd rather, you know, create a video or an animation to help spread the word about something that I believe in. So it's kind of like where I am right now. Are you an intellectual or are you just a creative guy? Like, how can you, how can you exist here? So that's something that Stanton Peel has taught me that, um, no, I always like to talk philosophy with him, mm -hmm. but because I thought that he liked that, but he mm -hmm. just sort of sees the world the way he's able to see it without much fanfare, I guess mm -hmm. uh, you might say. And he likes to do things practically like, all right, mm -hmm. I see the problems. I'm going to do something about it now. So mm -hmm. I would talk, you know, philosophy all day with him and be like, who the fucking cares? <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. You could sit around talking about this, but you know, all the problems have just happened a bunch of times while we were talking about it. So mm -hmm. it's good. Always good. Of course, to get your brain wrapped around something then in the right way and get adjusted. Yeah. But yeah, I think being, that's, uh, well, yeah. sorry to cut you off, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to input that. I think that's one of the things that I maybe find interesting about your podcast with, with Dr. Peel, Sundays with Stories, right? Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I find interesting about it and maybe didn't realize that that was what I found interesting about it, but is I think you guys make a interesting team of Stanton talking from his experience and research and you kind of getting more philosophical with the question and uh yeah it's a good it's a good combination i think oh you hit it on the head man so <laughs> that that one doesn't have a ton of uh viewership or listenership yet but um it's good stuff man you get you i like how fun. you get into into current events like the jordan peterson thing was really interesting i had never i was very sympathetic to his situation i was like oh man get off get off the drugs jordan i'm rooting for you and after listening to yours it's like well huh it's interesting, interesting way to think about it. So yeah, I appreciate what you guys are doing there. Oh, thanks, man. But th back to you. You can't fool me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do you see the the podcast going? And I guess just your, let's call the whole thing journalism. Because I was, um, when I started doing this show a long time ago before, this is something that probably isn't even around anymore. Um, a guy who, his name is uh, David Mindich. He's a professor of journalism at Temple now. I was interviewing him and I said something during the interview, like, um, well, I want to do journalism at some point. He's like, what do you think you're doing now? And mm. so he was sort of intuiting at that time, which is before that real big boom of technology where everyone's doing something that you, if you're asking questions and you're putting it out there and you're trying to get information across to other people, um, mm -hmm. and then you're doing journalism. So mm -hmm. let's preface it that way. What's, what's your future look like for your journalism uh yeah yeah um so that's something i'm pondering you know i don't i there are so many smart people out there interviewing so many other smart people and getting so many interesting ideas out to the world that my question i've been asking myself is do you really need to waste your energy trying to be as smart as everyone and doing the same thing so i'm i'm kind of in the space of like doing less podcasts um, doing them about specifically ideas that really interest me and then creating more content around that idea. So that's actually something that I mentioned I'm doing with your, with your book. Um, once I can find a, a damn second <laughs> to finish yeah. up. Oh, yeah. um, but I, I, yeah. So uh, just to give a little overview of what that will be is um, I'm, I'm almost done with basically laying out all the scenes. I just need to put movement and things to it, but um, it's going to be an animation style review of outgrowing addiction um, which i hope to do for more books so the ideal situation would be maybe once a month have a guest on who's written a book read the book talk to the guest then come up with uh, clips and also um the animation style review of the book to so cool. spread the message so it's i i really i i think that there's this uh opening for people to exist where 
they are kind of an intermediary between these higher levels of thought and the rest of society. Like not everyone wants to sit down and listen to Lex Friedman and Elon Musk talk about, you know, whatever it is they talk about, right. but there, but there, there could be interesting things that could be boiled down into a four minute entertaining sort of uh, animation or video. So that's kind of the space I think I want to put myself in is this guy who's listen is listening to these sorts of things, but then providing a way for uh, the general public to access in a, in an easier way. That just hits all your skills, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. So that's crazy. So I'm just realizing that how I've asked you, there's a behind the scenes. I've asked you before, if you would want to collaborate <laughs> in the future. Yeah. And I, I can't quite tell exactly why I like, I couldn't even think of the project that we would do, but it would be really cool to collaborate with you. And I think for, be really valuable. And I'm just realizing now that um, I'm trying not to besmirch myself by saying this, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but the way that I put information out there is, I read or hear or understand someone's point of view so deeply. And then I, I maybe get troubled that other people aren't understanding mm. it, mm -hmm. um, which is the same thing. When I have a point of view, it's really hard to implement it because I think deeply and critically about things. It's sometimes mm. I have trouble making it practical. So the mm. way that I make all those things practical is by sitting down, talking it out the way, you know, talking to people about their own ideas, the way that I understand them so that people mm -hmm. who are listening can get it. And then that, you know, push the information out that way or yeah, write a yeah. book about it or whatever. Yep. Um, and that's a little selfish because it's like, it's really cathartic for me because I had to get that out there. And that's the way that I do it. I try to be a good listener all the while, you know, I try not too much to make podcasts about me, but here I am in this one talking about <laughs> No, no, this um, is good. This, this builds. You seem to be and i've always thought this and i've always enjoyed the, your style of interviewing you put the person you're interviewing way out front sort of like i'm a musician so i know you know and um when you're doing mixes then you put vocals out front mm -hmm. um you put your interviewee out front and <laughs> you're smart and you could hang with all of, i mean you could get into the web of intellectualness but it seems like you prefer to let people speak and give them opportunities to speak in a, in a forum, maybe they wouldn't have otherwise been able to, yeah. you're just, you're I, a listener and you're humble. I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate that. Cause that, it, that has been the goal is to, I don't know, maybe there's part of um, fear of sounding stupid that contributes to that, which might be something I should address, but there's also just a genuine, um, acknowledgement of my own limitations and my own, you know, time is a finite resource. Every day we only have so much time. I can only focus on so many things. This person that I'm bringing in has spent way more time than me on this topic. There's nothing I can tell them that is probably going to be new unless mm. it's from my own experience. You know, it's, I'm not going to have uh, Zach Rhodes or Stan Peel on and, and teach them something fundamental about addiction. I can tell them about my experience and relate that to them. But I think the you know, I read a really good quote yesterday. So this is actually that book I mentioned by Jonathan Rosen. Mm. Um, but all right, yeah. So this, this this really resonated with me last night reading. It's the challenge is that to have proper curiosity about anything, you need to know at least something so that the question of what you don't know carries some value. Yeah. So it's like I I come into these conversations having some base level uh, knowledge about what we're going to talk to. And then the goal is to have enough knowledge beforehand that the questions you ask are genuine and actually matter. So I'm not asking them something I could just Google where it's like, I want to know enough to be curious, but I don't want to devote so much time to this thing to become an expert. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so valuable. <laughs> and talk about practical. So you're saying like, you have you have something to offer, so this is not just like uh, intellectual like masturbation or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You actually have something to offer that there's a skill that you've honed that you can funnel all this stuff into and put it out there, and it's like valuable to the masses. It could be mm -hmm. like, so you taking you taking keynotes from people's ideas and putting them into digestible, understandable videos. You're intelligent enough to understand it you may or may not want to like hang in the 
you know, in the forefront of that debate or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, of that piece of knowledge. But it's it, to some level, you're like, well, what am I going to have experts on? And I'm going to get well, so well versed in every single one. Yeah. Like how yeah. long would that take? And so you are trying to practically figure out a, a system for generating good news out of it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, does the world really need me to spend all my spare time learning about a topic and stressing myself out when I, you know, am not able to keep up with someone or is it more valuable to use the skills I already have and just become a sort of amplifier for good ideas. And I think yeah. that's, that's what I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. So, um, I was telling, I don't, who was I telling someone? Here's another, um, here's another problem I have <laughs> that maybe, maybe it'll help me sort out. Did you know that <laughs> actually I was getting wholesale therapy from you right now? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, uh, in line with the first principle thing. Like I've always cheated. Uh, I don't know. You think of it like cut the line or something. And you also mentioned imposter syndrome. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example. I'm a musician. I'm a professional musician, p piano singer, play sax mm. and drums. And I was, do you play music? Yeah. I play some guitar. All right. So, you know, uh, well, you all have something similar on guitar, but on piano, especially you can play inter, you know, you could play different intervals, different hand positions for different mm -hmm. chords. And so I remember being young and I was taking piano lessons. And so someone would say like, play a C chord and I would play, instead of C, E, G sequentially, I would mix up the notes so that my hand could be, it's just so that I could go to the next chord with ease, which is what mm. you do. It'd be, you're mm. taught eventually to do that. And I was told, no, 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 you, that's something you can do, but you just want to play it straight. And then eventually, like, as you get more, and I always have always thought about every topic, like, why would I have to wait? That's not how mm. you do it with anything. Like, mm. I think about a kid learning a language, and that's not how it works. You don't, if they learn a word or learn a concept or learn how to describe something, you don't say like, no, that's a 12th grade thing to think and explore mm, and understand. Mm -hmm. So I've always been that way. So I'm trying to figure out what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm still growing too. So I'm trying to figure out what it is that, um, that I can use. That's what I do with everything. Like mm -hmm. I'm not actually an addiction expert. I'm a fake one, but I've studied <laughs> it so hard and learned so much about it that I know all of the addiction experts, the most famous ones in the world. And they, I'd speak at the conferences and, Mm -hmm. I talk, talk about imposter syndrome. I'm not really <laughs> a musician, but I, I am because I play concerts and get paid to do it. And mm -hmm. I'm not really a, a journalist, but I am because I make money putting out <laughs> journalism. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you have found that sort of same, that same sort of niche for yourself. And I wonder, have you encountered people um, in your wake, I guess you'd say, in like, people younger than you or less experienced than you who want to do something similar and um have you had any good advice for them likewise have you experienced anybody who's further along in what you're trying to do or like what i'm trying to do and have you gotten any good advice from people like that and by the mm -hmm. way sorry that i have sometimes i feel like if i just give a shorthand explanation of something that maybe you and i understand that mm -hmm. a more a bigger audience won't know what I'm even talking about. So <laughs> I felt felt compelled to just give a little explanation there. No, no, I like <laughs> it. I'm glad you did. It makes it makes sense. And just just to make sure I have it. So basically, yeah. you're saying that um, whenever you approach a topic or something, you just dive in and you learn. You don't you don't necessarily see the point in starting at the most the most basic level entry point you want to just dive in and absorb what you absorb and, gr and grow up from there as opposed to. And, yeah. and that's, I think a skill that I've been able to actually share with the world because mm. I can do that. I'm able to then share it. And that's part of my bent is that I take a skill, do it. And then it's always something that I try to give value to other people because I've done it. I'm, mm. I'm juxtaposing that with you having mm -hmm. sort of done the same thing. Gotcha. Just, and, um, in that you could hang intellectually in a conversation, but maybe instead of trying to hang intellectually, you will actually do something productive with the conversation, which mm -hmm. is to be a great listener and reflector, and then also take the information, bundle it in a digestible way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I haven't had any, I'm trying to think, have I? No, I haven't had anybody 
seek my advice on the matter yet. Maybe and talk again in five years and mm. see if that changes. But mm. well, I am uh, I am now, so that counts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that the how I came to this. So you're you're kind of there's you and one other person are in a similar realm of doing things in a similar way that I want to do them. You're more, ex, you have more of an expertise, I think, but you still uh, um, explore a top, a wide range of topics on your show. It's not like you're an addiction show. Like you're, right. you're just, let's talk about ideas show. So that, I mean, I've, we, we have, we've had some long conversations and I've, I've, uh, you know, absorbed a lot of what you said about your own experience and took that to heart. And there's also another friend, Eamon Armstrong, who runs a, a podcast called life is a festival and he he has a little more ex his his expertise is like festivals and psychedelic psychedelic research psychedelic therapy um but he also very much is open to having conversations aqua across a wide variety of topics um so i've always just look, looked at kind of you two guys honestly as like being an example for how curiosity can get you through this and then also comedians dude comedians to me right now oh, are yeah. like the people who are really setting the bar of this type of um, medium like people like joe rogan is a great example tim dylan even um people who have a, com a comedic background there's no reason joe rogan should be able to talk to like a egyptian archaeologist right, right but right. but he can do it because he's like he's just as curious about it and so he has a base level of knowledge about the subject. Maybe he's read the book of the guest or watched a documentary and he's curious about the world and that's enough to, to create an interesting conversation. So it's really like comedians for me have been huge in accepting that you don't need to be the expert to have interesting conversations. I'm calling full X Friedman on you, I, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Are you afraid of death? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the comedians have like the thing I'm, ex I'm explaining that I can do is I can become an expert in something that I'm sufficiently interested in in such mm -hmm. a short amount of time that if I am interested in it and I know other people are interested in it, give me a year or two and I will give you the gist of whatever it is in mm -hmm. a way that people who are experts at it would agree with. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a skill and I try to do that all the time. Yeah. Um, you you have a skill of making things digestible, so that like the masses could understand it. Like anyone mm -hmm. could could go to a an animated video that breaks down con you know more complex concepts. And so that's a a great skill that you have that takes many more dimensions than just like you don't just regurgitate something. It's like you artistically do it. Comedians have the skill of there, it seems like comedians are so interested in just everything social because mm -hmm. the, what they're seeing is, um, did we talk about this last time? The, the, no, I don't think so. The, the um, what is water? Um, oh my God, I forget his name. David Foster Wallace mm. gave, gave this speech and you start, he started off with a parable where uh, two young fish were swimming. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like comedians are, the, are always seeing the water. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always looking at it and they're saying, we're all idiots. And then so yeah. they, they have this like great artistic way of delivering information out to other people. What do you think comes first? The ability, you know, the skill or the ability to do that or the curiosity? Mm. Or yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great question. And again, so I, th I mean, I pretty much believe pretty universally that any skill can be developed with the right mm -hmm. amount of interest and energy, you know, just has to take interest and energy equals skill. But you know, you look at someone like Joe Rogan, who we just brought up, who has made millions of dollars off of just being curious. Like, if you go back and watch his early episodes, but, they're horrible. They're so bad. And yeah. he, like, he clearly has developed that skill. So I, I, 
I think that there's like a base level of curiosity of like in, interest in the world that you have to have. And even then it could probably be developed still. So I, for me, you know, when I was depressed, there was none of that interest or curiosity. Like I was always, I was never the guy at a, a function or an event asking someone questions to get to know them. I, I, I admit that I had a very like surface level relationship with most people because I wasn't very curious about who they were or what was going on. And after coming out of that, um, I think curiosity started to develop more and more in me. So I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think it, someone like Tim Dillon, who is always, always just seems to be seeing seeing what is going on in a very real way and able to, I don't know, he just has this knack for being able to, you know, call a spade a spade that whenever maybe everyone else is seeing a diamond or a club and he's yeah. like, wait, no, what are you guys talking about? This is a fucking spade. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I don't know. He, it's hard to say that he doesn't have some sort of natural ability, but I, mm. yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. I won't divert too much, but I don't, <laughs> I do listen to his podcast regularly. Yeah, I actually was just listening to it when it, like a little before we got on. His most recent episode? Yeah, with so, Anna Kachian. Oh, oh, okay. So the one before that is what I was thinking mm -hmm. of where he, he makes me think about things I don't want to think about because he can make them funny. Mm -hmm. And that's such a freaking, that's such a gift. Maybe what was it? Do you remember? Yeah. You remember? Well, I'm going to try and it's, it was so well done. Like, people think of him as just like careless. Mm, which in a way no. he sort of is, but he's so, also so careful. Right. Um, so he was talking about, so the fact that I have laughed before this, uh, this is not, this information is not funny, but it was, uh, <laughs> there was a murder that was caught on someone's door cam, you know, the doorbell ring, whatever it's called. And he was describing that his producer, Ben had him watch the thing he, not knowing that that's what it was. He's like, what the hell? And then he described it in detail. And he described that the person um, at the end it was shot this person and, and was said just before he shot them that um, he's like, you should have kept your mouth shut. And so he was describing this and he kept saying over and over again, it's like, if you are disturbed by this, just fast forward five minutes. It's not, I promise it'll get better. I just, this is on my mind, blah, blah, blah. And he kept bringing that up, kept bringing it mm. up said this stuff at the end he's like so deeply disturbed and it's like this thing shouldn't have ever happened it's disgusting but <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so he just creates that he made you on his side right he's it's you're on his good side because he's doing the saying the right things mm -hmm. but you're with them all the way and yep. then he said and then like what could possibly come after but and he just holds that pause for so long. And then he just makes, you know, makes it, he could so do so much for that space. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, was that the end of the story? So I don't want to cut. No, no, off. that's, that's the, I won't even yeah. go in. Cause I'll ruin the joke after that. Cause he did it so amazingly, but yeah. There was, just, I, I feel compelled to just mention another similar in the one I just watched the most recent one as of today, he was talking about, um, David Hogg. Do you know David Hogg? Yeah. yeah. The Parkland survivor. Mm -hmm. And he was like, scared. <laughs> like this, this is a trigger warning for sure. But he was like, you're not a victim. You survived a school shooting. Like you came oh, out right, of there. Right, right. You should, you should be happy to survive. Like you can't call yourself a victim anymore. You're a victim when you go through it, but you lived like, shut up kid. Okay. And so, you know, what's so crazy like, is that like, Oh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say it makes you, it's like what you said, where he makes you think about something where you're like, Ooh. Yeah. Right. I would never have thought that. Never yeah. have said that. Yeah. I don't want to be on your side. How did you get me on? <laughs> it's like when you're watching the Sopranos or something and you're on Tony Soprano's side, even though he kills yeah. a bunch of people or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. I feel like that's the space that Louis CK was trying to joke mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that, that people had so much pushback against him for. Yeah. If you remember that. Yeah, he was trying to work out his material about a joke like that, but he couldn't quite land it. It just wasn't quite that funny yet. I mean, people yeah. on the thing. And then he got called out anyway. Yeah, I feel like that that kind of stuff is like, if there's anything that saves us from ourselves, it's going to be comedians starting it, I feel like, because they're the ones who are, you know, calling out both sides. And, and if you're listening, you realize just how stupid 
the, all the fighting that goes on in our country is and that we just need to like chill out and mm. enjoy enjoy life so i don't know I, i'm i'm thankful we have comedians like those and andrew schultz of course and you know the rest. so have you spoken to any comedians on your podcast no but i would love to i would love to have I'm you a- no, but again, I want to. That's that. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned all that because that's the lane I wanted to start going down. Is like, um, I would love to have Mark Norman on, for instance. Oh my or, god, like, he's uh, my favorite right now, dude. He's so yeah. good. Just, just people who don't mind, who people who are funny but don't mind just talking about the craft of their, their craft. Yeah, they the things that I think about are can get so dark. Like I try mm-hmm. not to get in a dark place myself, but yeah, I mean the, the stuff going on in the world is tough to parse mm-hmm. and it gets so emotionally invested. And I feel like comedy gives you an excuse to, um, to think those things, but in a lighter way. Yeah. For those, sure. those guys are just phenomenal at living in that space. Yeah, I agree. And it's, yeah, it's hard to be, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, maybe even impossible to be like a alt-right person or be an Antifa person and have comedy. Like, what are you going to joke about? You, mm. you know, it's not going to be funny. And I feel like comedians just occupy that middle space so well. And it's, right. uh, yeah. All right. So maybe that's, our, it should be a joint effort. We should maybe start getting comedians. To talk <laughs> yeah. To I'm That'd down, cool. man. That'd be that's, so cool. That's our new project. <laughs> yeah, right. Just that, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I could never be a comedian, no. <laughs> Not, but uh but it'd be yeah. cool to interview them. The only person <laughs> that thinks I'm funny is my girlfriend. Right. And, she's just, <laughs> and she was just trying to make it feel nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so the last thing I'll ask before I, I'd love you to plug any and everything is, do you feel pressured to get conversations done in a time frame and have specific content when you're interviewing people? I ask because your, your interviews seem to flow really naturally. Like you have, you have the key points in front of you and on hand, but your podcast seemed to flow really naturally and let the speaker be the speaker. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know if it's some sort of control issue, but I tried, it's like I'm in a rush or some time urgency yet. Mm. I never finish in a reasonable amount of time. So I always feel like I'm rushed and like, Oh, I need to grasp for something. Yeah. And this conversation with you has been an experiment a little bit in allowing myself the last two conversations and allowing myself to just, uh, take it in a direction that maybe has nothing to do with why I asked you to be on yeah, and, for and, sure. and seeing what that's like. So yeah. anyway, uh, have you played around with that or have you been caught up in that or how do you think about that sort of um, cadence yeah. thing? Yeah. The cadence thing is interesting. Cause I, there's many times where I feel I've shared that same feeling of being rushed and never having been fully into it and never yeah, yeah, like yeah. kind of trying to be one step ahead of it instead of letting it just uh, occur where it's, I don't know. I think the best conversations I've had and the last two we've done have been really fun. I've had a great time. So same. yeah. Um, but I think the best conversations I've had have been, where oh, that's an interesting question i mean i feel like the best ones that i've had have always happened because in some way i've let the other person lead the dance you know like these are very much like a dance and one person has to lead and the other one person is kind of following and i think whenever i'm trying to lead it it's whenever I leave feeling really dissatisfied with it. Mm. But if I let the other person take it where they want to take it, you know, Joe Rogan, again, sorry to just be. No, he's a great example for a lot of things. Gobbling on him, but he, (laughs) he, he does it so well. He's like, he, he is really good at not feeling confined by the topic that was agreed upon and let, if the guest brings up something to let it go down the tangent and then come back. And I feel like when it, the best ones I've had are where I've allowed that to happen and not viewed as the the conversation as needing to happen within a confined, narrow scope of interest, you know? So, so how, do you have a formula for achieving that? So like if I have, let's say I had Jordan Peterson on tomorrow, mm-hmm. I would feel like mm-hmm. I need to figure out how to do this in a way that I'm not wasting his time. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't then feel free to yeah. make the conversation the way that I know it would be the best conversation, mm. ironically. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point. And I think about, 
like I feel like I've done a really good job of this with my a couple of recent ones I've had. There was one I recently did where I really I left it feeling super dissatisfied. Um, <laughs> I won't mention which one it was, but um, the two that I mentioned earlier, Anthony Magnabosco and Jonathan Rosen, when I interviewed them, I. I came in prepared with specific things I wanted to talk about, but there was already an acknowledgement beforehand of, um, of letting it flow in some way. And I, I don't know, it's hard to say what the formula is. It's just more so the mindset going in and sitting down. Like I, the, the, the one that I mentioned that was not good. I definitely sat down feeling like, okay, I have to talk about these points. We have to hit these things. They have limited time. We only have an hour and I have to make sure we stay on track. Um, and the, the other two, Jonathan Rose and Anthony Magnabosco, I just had a couple major things that I wanted to talk about. And there was almost, it was almost a, an, a way a nod to you and just like being like, okay, take your time with each idea, listen to what they're saying, you know, be present for what they're saying and they will bring up something interesting mm. to talk about. You know, you don't need to be the one with all these prepared questions necessarily. You just have to be present and actually listening to them and they will give you something to ask about, you know, like, what do you mean by this? What, what do you think? I don't know. It's, it's it just sounds a, like you'd difference. be a good, you'd be a good clinician. <laughs> like that's, that's sort of the formula that I've noticed that like the more I hone my own clinical skills, <laughs> in listening to people talk about their issues like i i'm not i even though i'm sort of there's a weird hierarchy there when someone comes to see you for mm -hmm. professional help but where you're a little bit on top and you're supposed to lead something but mm -hmm. at the same time it's like well i can't you, it's your experience so you're gonna have to figure it out but i can help that mm -hmm. I feel like that's what interviewing is like great interviewing yeah. is larry king was a good example of yeah. someone who did that for sure. Yeah. yeah, I agree. He was great. Uh, Tim Ferriss does a pretty good job of that too. Mm. Of He comes in with very prepared questions, a lot of structure to what he wants to talk about, but I always feel like he's super present in what, in, in what his guest is saying and ready to chase them down whatever rabbit hole they want to go, which I think is the best way to do it. Well, thank you for running with me down every rabbit hole that I caught <laughs> for us today. Yeah, uh, it was fun. Eric, Please plug any and everything that you're working on right now or maybe working on in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can visit my site, ericwhite.com. There's no I in white. So it's E-R-I-C-W-H-T-E.com. You can also go to the e the EW podcast.com and that'll redirect. Um, the EW podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, pretty much everywhere. Um, and yeah, on social media, the Eric white formula with no, I also is, uh, where you'll find me. I'm on Instagram and Twitter mostly. Um, and the main thing coming up, like I mentioned before, is going to be this, uh, focus on YouTube stuff. So, um, that would be probably where I would, uh, encourage people to go find me if they want to stay up to date. Cause that's where the more interesting things will be happening this year. So yeah, working on that. Um, and there's, yeah, that's pretty much it right now, but. Right on, man. Thanks so yeah. much for talking to me again and, you know, doing like a sort of a rerun through uh, <laughs> everything we talked about. It was great talking to you and I hope you keep up the amazing work. Thanks brother. You too, man. Appreciate right, it. Take care.